I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, something that I have been doing since about 2005. I started the company in 2003. We called it MicroSeismic Inc. and we vowed we were going to do all sorts of things passive, all sorts of passive seismic techniques. Um, now I liken passive seismic to conventional as a stethoscope is to an ultrasound. So we were going to do all sorts of things where we put the stethoscope on the chest of the reservoir or the earth and listen to the squishy sounds that were coming out of it and from that to do something about what was going on in the reservoir, where fluids were moving in the pipes and be able to feed that back to the reservoir engineer to help him more effectively um, and efficiently produce the hydrocarbons from that reservoir. I told my investors when they invested in the company that I was going to do everything except hydrofrac monitoring. Not that I was afraid of hydrofrac monitoring, it's just that it, at that time the legacy way of doing it involved going downhole and I don't know anything about downhole geophysics. I've always been kind of a surface guy. Some people would say Peter's just this deep, but never mind. Uh, I, would, I, I didn't want to do downhole geophysics and also there were guys in that business like Schlumberger and Halliburton and Weatherford and all these big billion dollar corporations that a guy starting a company in his bedroom w would feel a little bit um, challenged by. So as it turns out today, 100% of my business is hydrofrac monitoring and we've taken on about a 50% market share taking business away from Schlumberger and Halliburton but not entirely because it's a growing field. Obviously, when I started, not obviously, when I started the company, the shales weren't really the big issue that they were, that they are now. And hydrofracking was still popular, but wasn't paid much attention to. And frac monitoring was something that was done on just a very few wells, whereas now it's, it's a big business. So microseismic monitoring, to put it into context, uh, you all know about the shale gale that's hitting the United States and soon to hit the rest of the world uh, where we have this tremendous opportunity where all of a sudden the 79% of the sedimentary column that we always thought was just source rock is now becoming reservoir rock that we can harvest oil and gas from. What amazes me is just how fast this is changing. Maybe it's just because I'm old, but uh, this, this map here was produced in 2008 by the USGS and those who are students of the shale will notice immediately that there is one oil field conspicuous or gas field conspicuous by its absence and it is Terry? The Bakken. Uh, well that's an oil field so this is just the gas. Eagleford. The Eagleford, thank you very much. The Eagleford. Well, you had it for sale down there though. Which oh. is Eagleford. Well no the Pearsall yeah but the Eagleford's much bigger than this. It goes all the way up here and the Pearsall would be a a different horizon. Never mind. I could count on Terry finding fault. <laughs> Eagleford's not on there because the Hawkville number one in the Petrohawk Hawkville field had not yet been drilled or was not known. It was drilled in the fall of 2008. That one field of 400 square kilometers actually now is thought to have more reserves than the granddaddy of them, the Barnett. That's how fast things are changing. And, well, you all know about how much, how the shale gas is, is moving to produce an ever-increasing fraction of the gas that we produce uh, soon to be, I think, close to 30% if it isn't there already now. Again, along the lines of how fast things are changing, here's a cumulative diagram of production per, through 2008 of the gas, and the, the Barnett clearly dominates there. And yet just a month ago, the Haynesville surpassed the Barnett in month-to-month -month production, uh, getting more than uh, 5,000 million cubic feet, uh, 5,000 cubic feet per day production out there. So uh, it's changing very fast. Here, another diagram from 2008. And we all know that in 2001, the, uh, the current thinking was that the Marcellus uh, everybody except Terry, the current thinking was that the Marcellus could produce perhaps 1.9 TCF. By 2008, the Potential Gas Committee put it at 250 TCF, and nowadays it's somewhere between 450 and 500 or 600. I don't know, it keeps growing. So uh, that's an amazing thing, but again, the Mars, the, there is no Eagleford on here. So the message 
Clearly, things are changing very, very fast, but it isn't the rocks that are changing, is it? These rocks are two, three, four hundred million years old or better. So it's the technology that is now allowing us to pull the hydrocarbons out of these rocks, rocks that are so tight that perhaps the only thing that is tighter in the wellbore than the rock itself is the steel pipe. And how are we getting it out? What is the technology that's allowing us to produce that hydrocarbon? Certainly one of them is horizontal drilling. This is one of Whiting's wells up in the Sanish field. And that well went down 10,000 feet. It turned the corner 90 degrees and it then drilled out more than two miles and stayed within a 75 foot horizon. That's amazing technology. It makes me want to be an engineer rather than pointy headed geophysicist. So horizontal drilling, and then there's fracking, of course, that's the other technology. Now, fracking's getting a lot of press these days, most of it bad, it's not a new technology. This is one of the first fracks done in the United States in the Hugoton Field, Kansas, 1947. It's a pretty high-tech outfit. We've got the water tanks over here, we've got the blender here. This is the pump over here, and that is the one piece of control equipment. Sorry, sir, I'm standing in front of you. Am I moving out of camera? I'm hoping so. Um, so that one little dial, pressure dial, the engineer would watch it as the pressure increased while they pumped harder and harder and harder. And the little mice that were inside here running on the track. And when the, when the rock would break, that dial would flip back because the fluid had rushed out of the well bore into the, into the reservoir. Now in order to prop open the fracks, they thought, they thought they had created they would then dump all manner of things down the wellbore, crushed glass, buckshot, nails, anything that they thought would go out into the fracks to hold them open. Of course, today when they frack, it's a whole different story. The circus comes to town. This is, in fact, one of Range's sites, the best unit in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania. A couple of things to note here. Note all of the beautiful green pastoral land that you are so familiar with all the way around. This, this site, and you can get some sense of the size of it from the length of that 18-wheeler, actually is a pad that hosts seven wells. And that's one of the modern things these days. With horizontal drilling, you can uh, extract the hydrocarbons from the shale over an area that is probably three or four square miles from a surface facility that is no bigger than this. And in fact, once the pumping is done, once all these trucks go away, then all that will be left are those seven Christmas trees sitting in the middle of that little parking lot. The industry is working hard to reduce the visual pollution that's associated with the production of these hydrocarbons. And we have these long horizontal wells and they're getting more efficient about being able to produce from them putting packers in the wells such that they don't have to pull the pipe out before they go ahead and frack into each subsequent well. And then the third technology, the first being horizontal drilling, the second being fracking, the third technology that has really changed the way we do business in these shales and has enabled the production from the shales is microseismic monitoring. Now, why? Well, in the, in the pre-microseismic monitoring days, the engineers had to guess where their fracks went. If they put 100,000 barrels of fluid down the well, they ran isotropic models in their computer and they assumed that 50,000 barrels went out to the left and 50,000 barrels went out to the right. And if it were a lateral well, they assumed that it was equally spread all the way down the well. As we've done more monitoring, we have recognized that in fact rocks are not very homogeneous. Anybody who's driven through a road cutter on all you people know that. So even within the boundaries, the length of one well, and this is one of Whiting's wells from the Bakken, the Sanish field, you can see even in the length of that 10,000 foot well, there is a high degree of variability stage to stage in the fracking as revealed by the microseismic data. Each one of the different colors represents a different frack stage in the treatment of the well from toe to heel. Each one of the balls represents, is the proxy for the hypocenter location, the point at which the rock broke. So you can see at the toe, we have a very weak frack, and that's typical. We haven't, we haven't pressured up the rock yet. 
So often the toe fracs are very weak. And then as we move down, we have kind of a complex frac going out a little further to the north than to the south. In here, we have an area of rock that didn't break at all. That represents unharvested hydrocarbons. Down here, we're getting out quite far to the south in a narrow frac, probably a zone of weakness, a joint or a pre-existing fracture that's been taken advantage of, and so on down the well. The engineers looking at this kind of diagram will tune the treatment on a per well basis to try to optimize what they are getting out or how they are fracking, com com how complex a frack they are creating around that well. They'll look at this and they'll know that the next well needs to create fracks that come back about the same distance this way. So we can give them information about well spacing. The first well, that well that I showed you from range, that best unit, we had, they had five wells parallel that they drilled at 500 foot spacing. They found based on the microseismic data that the two wells in the middle were redundant because their fracks were getting out that far. So the next pad they only had to use three wells at a thousand foot spacing to get the same drainage. That saved them about three to five million dollars per well, ten million dollars for the cost of that monitoring. That's why the oil and gas guys do it. So we can tell them not just what about that one well, we can tell them where to put the next wells. We can show them in real time even where the fracks are going. Now, au courant of the things going on today, we can also tell them where the fracks are not going. We can tell them that the fracks are contained within a space of two or three hundred feet above and below the well and not going anywhere near the aquifers up, sh up shallow. Or, in fact, watching in real time, should something untoward go on, a break in the casing, shallower or, or fracks starting to head up, we can shut the operation down. There is a tool then where for the oil company's concerns we can monitor how the frack is doing and for the neighborhood's concern we can monitor what the frack isn't doing. That's an important message. So what do the results look like for one of these fractures? This is a, a quick movie. It is a, a range well and I thank them. They're very generous at letting me show their data. You're looking at it in map view here. You see the seven wells that were drilled off to the northwest from this pad. The colored uh, areas represent the successive stages from toe to heel that they perfed. You have a section view. Uh, these are thousand foot squares to give you some sense of the scale. So the wells are three to five thousand feet long. This is a section view. You have the drill stem coming down and then the horizontal bits of here uh, concentrated at 6,500 feet. The dark lines represent 500 feet. So we're up at 4,000 feet below sea level here. And of course, sea level and aquifers are way up here. And we'll run this movie. This represents several months or several weeks worth of data all compressed down into a movie. And again, you'll start to see the fracks grow out from the well bores, the size of the balls, they are now sized proportional to the magnitude of the events. 